Moving on to item four, meeting with police Burton, Chief Burton. Chief Burton, you have the floor, sir. Welcome back. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas, all that stuff, because I probably won't see you again before then. I uh, thought I'd talk about the topic of the week. Uh, it appears uh, that uh, there's a lot of confusion uh, out in the public about the community outreach unit. Um, I'm not sure who they spoke with to get the story started, but apparently it started the rumor that we were doing away with community policing. We were stopping community policing. That's nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, what uh, we are proposing is a new iteration of the current the current unit. Uh, we are having difficulties recruiting for the un unit, uh, and I can share with you some of the reasons I think that that it's happening. Um, recruiting for the current unit as it is, that's correct. as it exists. That's correct. Okay, and uh, you know, the, p the people that are police officers signed on to be police officers. Okay, mm -hmm. so they want to do police work as well as engage in community policing. Well, if you're on the community outreach unit, you're doing nothing but just community policing. You're not doing any kind of enforcement action, things like that. So people tend to get bored with it, and they came on board to be police officers. So it's my guess that they lose interest after a little while, and they want to go back and do, do policing. And so uh, the community policing piece of it, while people enjoy doing it, they like doing the other stuff too. So I think that's one of the driving factors. Is that because of the social work aspect to the community policing? No, ma'am, and it's not so much the uh, social work aspect of it, it's just they don't get any action, to be honest with you. They're not out there working the street, and they miss it. And so uh, they want to go back and, and, and do some police work for a while. But what, uh, what, sorry, but what do you mean, like, like action, like car chases? Sure, sure, absolutely. That's why, that's why police officers become police officers. You know, they, they want to uh, go in and handle the calls and recover stolen cars and catch burglars and do all the things that police officers do. So do you still have your community service aides? Yes, yes. So can the community service aides be tapped more to do that? To do the car chases and no, things? No, no, the community's uh, outreach. No, actually, it's not going away. That, that's where all the confusion lies. Uh, it's just taking on a different form. What we have done is combined, we've taken eight officers. What we want to do is take eight officers and two sergeants and assign each one of those officers, those eight officers, to one of the beats in the city. We have eight beats in the city. They'd be assigned to that uh, area to do the exact same thing the COU unit is doing right now, but only in those four small neighborhoods. So it's an attempt to uh, have community policing go citywide. Okay, so what's gonna keep those eight officers from having that same feeling? Good question. Uh, they're going to also work uh, part-time in the downtown area. And so when we need them downtown, like during football games and things like that, they'll engage in those activities. Uh, when they're not doing that, they can work together on problems that are identified by citizens, uh, that citizens want us to work on. And they'll have eight people that they can draw, draw from. And so they won't all be in their own beat every day. They'll be working all over the city, working on problems that have been highlighted by either citizen interaction, where they found out something needed to be uh, worked on, or citizen requests. If I'm still confused. Okay. So walk, walk me through it one more time. Okay. So you've got eight officers, eight beats. You'll have one of, the, one of each of these officers will go to each, each one of, of these those beats. beats. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so if I'm, let's just say beat 10, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm the officer assigned to beat 10. My, my purpose is to be a problem solver for the things that go on in beat 10. Okay. okay. Now so are I, you having town hall meetings in sure, B10? Absolutely. How are you going to know what the people want? Because I'm going to be I'm going to be talking to people. That's going to be a big part of my job. And how are you going to be talking to them? Face to face, by telephone, uh, by email, how, however the person decides to communicate with us. So are you going to like have regular monthly meetings with? I don't know the that residents? they'll be monthly, but uh, maybe Quarterly. not all year round. But uh, there, there will be regularly scheduled meetings that they can set up if they have a particular issue, or a citizen can request a meeting. It says there's something going on in my neighborhood I'd like to, to talk to you about. And, and how then, will they go about that? I mean, is there information that's gonna be applied, supplied to 
people to let them know that this is the new change that's going to happen. Absolutely. This is who is over your beat. Absolutely. This is who you need to contact. Absolutely. I mean, is that, that to me, that seems like that, that needs to be information that is flooded out there so that residents will know, so that people will know who to contact in their beat if they have an issue and concern. We'll do it. The, we did it the same way we did it when we started the COU. Nobody knew those officers either, and now they're very well known. We just do the same thing over again. The only difference is it'll be citywide. So an officer would be more or less the community officer for Absolutely. that specific beat. Absolutely. And if it's a problem in that beat, that officer is the point of contact. Correct. Okay. So I, oh, sorry. Um, so how many officers were in the traditional COU unit? The original was eight is there as well. Okay, and from what I understood is that they dealt with a, they weren't in every um, beat, they were in just a few neighborhoods. Correct. And so do you think that putting only one in each beat um, will have the same effect as having a couple in just a few neighborhoods? Okay, don't, don't, view, don't view it as one officer in each beat because they have seven other officers that they'll have, uh, yeah, they'll have uh, uh, access to, to address issues in their beat. So I, let's say all of you are in this unit, okay? And Ms. Williams has a problem in her beat. She's gonna say to all of you, I've got this plan to work on this problem with auto thefts in my beat, and I need your help. So we go over there, we work in Ms. Williams' beat for a while, and we work on the auto theft issue. Then a, an issue comes up over here on this beat over here with um, uh, something else, okay? And that person asks for help. All seven of the other people will help them with their issue, and that's how it'll be done. Right now, they do the same thing, okay? But they don't have the, the downtown responsibility. So we're adding a little responsibilities to them, which will help patrol, because right now we're having to have patrol work downtown when we have big events down there, on either on overtime or we have to take them out of beats to put them down there. Okay, so to make sure I'm understanding it now, because it's getting a little bit clearer, Eight officers, one in each beat, and they can call on the other officers more or less as, for lack of a better term, a specialized unit. I've got a problem in beat A. The other seven officers will come to beat A, work on that problem, and then when, once the problem has been resolved or no longer needed, they go back to their other beats. Well, they never really left. Never, okay. never really They're left, but they, this worked, they worked that issue and then went back, or you know, go back to right. whatever they're doing, in addition to working downtown, in addition to regular police work. Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah. And it's not much different than what we're doing now, except for the downtown element. The downtown unit has been empty for a year. And you'll recall that we got this community outreach unit, we had to trade in the traffic unit for it. So what we're trying to do is what the report that Sergeant Fox came up with in August that the council is supposed to um, review and then I think they're going to make some comments about it in December. What we're trying to do is do what was asked in that report, is expand community policing. But we're doing it with no additional resources. We're just trying to find another way to do it, another way to get those resources spread throughout the city. So um, that's, that's what it is. Nothing think, more, nothing less. I think that's sort of how I've been under, or come to understand it. It's a little more like a scaled down version of the community oriented policing we've been aiming for but we can't achieve with our current resources correct uh it's not really scaled down it's not just, scaled it's, down yeah we're, we're, we're working with what we've got correct i understand that correct um a, a couple of questions i got so with regards to pulling some of these or, or utilizing the team resources are there any beats that are not going to have any problems like are there are there people where we know that we're going to be able to kind of flex a couple officers over, or over or, and those beats aren't going to be detrimented by the... Very good question. Very good question. And you're absolutely correct. There are parts of the city where the biggest concern for the people that live in the neighborhood is parking issues. We're not going to spend a lot of time there, right? But we're going to have a liaison so that when you have a parking issue in your beat, even though it doesn't happen very often, you'll have an officer that you can contact, okay? And that officer may work on that parking issue by themselves or maybe only use one other officer to work on the parking issues in that beat and see if they can't solve it on behalf of the citizens. Probably uh, there'll, be, there'll be big issues that'll take all eight, but there'll be a lot of little issues like you're talking about that are not insignificant to the people that live there. They're significant to them, but they don't need eight officers to work on a parking issue. So 
it's, it's literally, it, it's, a, it's applying the concept of problem-oriented policing. If you get a chance, there's a book out by Mr. Uh, Dr. Herman Goldstein, and that's what it is. It's, it's uh, Problem-Oriented Policing is the name of the book. It's a real easy read. And all it does is teach officers to work with citizens to problem solve, okay? And so you have to have that liaison effort in the beginning to find out what Ms. Williams thinks is a problem in her beat, okay? Then put the re pool of resources together and then address that issue. If something comes up in Mr. Nichols' beat and he, that he wants us to work on, we're gonna use problem-oriented policing to do that. Problem-oriented policing requires that officers look at things critically and they try to solve the problem reduce its effects, or make it somebody else's problem. For instance, what's bothering you in your neighborhood may not be a police matter at all, maybe it's code enforcement, okay? Well, officers will be taught that they can go to quote code enforcement and get your problem solved for you, okay? In, instead of you having to do it. You've told the officer, and the officer can use the city resources to fix your problem. Uh, problem oriented policing is, it's, there's four major pieces of it, scanning, which is finding out what the problem is, analyzing it, responding to it, and then assessing whether or not you were successful in addressing the issues. You do that Sarah model over and over again. There are publications out there from the Department of Justice uh, that have, so other cities have done this. This is not reinventing the wheel. So let's say that auto theft issue I told you about. Other cities have already dealt with it and they've got, um, uh, pop projects that they've done on their cities with auto theft issues. And there are books published, there are little pamphlets that'll give officers ideas. Okay, here's where the cars are being stolen from, here's the time factors, here's what these cities did to help solve this problem in their city. So they're not reinventing the wheel. And there are all kinds of issues out there, all, all kinds of resources out there that we can use for individual problems. So are all your officers trained in this problem-oriented policing or is it just your community they, outreach? They are, but it's at the academy level and we want to take it a step further and get these eight involved. What is what is the interaction going to look like between the sort of this new organization and the, and the already existing B cops? I mean, if, if there are situations where the interact, like plugging the, uh, I'm sorry, what's the new unit's name? Not community outreach. Community units. resource. Unit. Community yeah. resource, sorry. Uh, let's say that officer assigned to be What's his interaction if, if someone's stopped by a normal beat cop to help uh, de-escalate the situation? What, what, what interaction does he have to connect the community to an actual beat cop who's just getting his police action in? Does that make sense? Uh, I'm, I'm imagining a situation where a beat cop stops somebody okay. for, for some infraction or, or some suspicion, some probable cause, but that individual who stopped has a relationship with this community resource or how does that play out? How, how can they leverage their interaction with a cop that they trust with a cop that they don't know, okay. don't I trust? See, I see what you're asking. Well, so let's say I'm the officer that's out there working the beat and you are the officer that's working the community resource unit, okay? We're, we're gonna talk. I mean, you're working in my beat, okay? So I will have meetings with officers that work in my beat as the community uh, resource officer. And I'll say I'm having this issue that Mr. Nichols has reported in my beat and I need your help. Patrol officers are not gonna be exempt either. When they have discretionary time, on the shifts that they do have discretionary time, they'll be very involved in that problem solving process. Hey, do you still have your community resource officers in this? Yes, the SROs, yes So are those officers a part of the community resource? No, nope, they could very well be though. If it's, let's say the, the they problem- they seem like prime candidates. Sure, sure, in the school, uh, but they're thin. We don't, we don't have very many of them. There's one in these high schools that are little cities in, in and of themselves. We've got big high schools. But they could be a part of it. So let's say, that's, that's a good thing to bring up, it gives me kind of a segue, that we're having problems with kids doing X after school's out, okay? And it's causing a traffic issue in the, in the neighborhood. And somebody complains to the community resource officer. Well, I'm gonna go to that SRO, and I'm gonna say, can you help me out? Either educating the students or telling them they can't park there because it's blocking traffic in the neighborhood or whatever the issue is and get that SRO's help. They may call on somebody in patrol, okay, depending on what time of the day it's happening. So they, they have resources that they'll be able to call upon, but you've got one person in every beat that's coordinating it, okay, and can direct those resources. Right now we don't have that except in four neighborhoods. 
folks, I want to emphasize, we've already proven this works. We knew it would work when we did it because community policing works. What okay. do you think the impact's going to be on the four neighborhoods that are losing the intensive? They're not, well, they're losing the intensity, but the relationships with the officers are still there. And I think one of the things that we benefited from is that the citizens have learned how to get a hold of those officers. Okay, uh, Prior to that, they had very little interaction with them. Uh, so it, it will be, it'll be a little bit less contact than they had before probably, but everybody in the city will have at least the opportunity to uh, work with officers to problem, solve problems in the area of the city where they live. Is there a plan to track or keep data on crime if already there's do. an increase we already in do. those communities? We have a crime analyst that, that analyzes crime on a monthly basis. Mm -hmm. uh, we compare it to five years ago. We compare it to last year, the same period of time, same 28-day period. So we can look at historical data and see if we're having an impact. Any special plans to look at this, those four specific neighborhoods? We already do. Okay. Yeah, we already do. Now, they won't, they'll be a part of the beat again, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll have to talk to the analyst and see if he can pull that data out for just that area. Because it would be interesting to know if the problems went back up That's, in those that's four areas. exactly what I'm getting yeah. at is... I want, I'd, it, I want to know, once the intensive, you know, community outreach unit leaves those four neighborhoods, is there a negative impact? There, there will be in some areas, and there'll be some that, that it'll be negligible. Right. But you got to have the data. Yep. Yep. So I guess kind of piggybacking off of that is what is your plan for kind of crime prevention, and do you think that these community resource officers um, do prevent crimes in those neighborhoods that they're in? Yes, they do. Just, just by their presence and the fact that they know citizens that are in that area. Um, this is not a new concept, folks. This is not a new concept. This has been done all over the country. I, I've, I've written articles about it. Um, it's a, a concept that uh, capitalizes on the resources that you have, okay, when you're not going to get any more, and work as a team to solve problems, working with citizens. Benchmark cities, any of the communities in benchmark cities use this model? I'm sure there are, but I don't know which one's off the top of my head. The only other question I have is, you and I spoke yesterday, this was one of the topics. Lieutenant Reichenberger? Richenberg. Uh, no, it's uh, Assistant Chief Richenberg. Assistant Chief, uh, he was at a CID meeting, said essentially the same thing you just said. Uh, have you been invited to city council? Because I'm sure there's a few council members who yeah are, they're asking a lot of questions and we're preparing for them and the city manager has been in communications with them all week and then we're going to the, the council meeting on monday night that was yeah to, was to answer questions what how are you going to measure the success of the cru the new cru well you measure it by the satisfaction of the citizens that, that's pretty much what you measure it right we, we measure it right now there's Even no by satisfaction not Reduction in, in crime, not reduction. Well, uh, all those things. All those things. Exactly the way we do it right now. And you're going to do it. We do it already citywide. But we've al we already know it's going to work. We know it's going to have an impact. If you know the officer that works the area that, where your street is, and you know them by first name, and they know you, that's what we're looking for in community policing. So that you're comfortable in bringing problems to the officer that's in, in your area, and they have the resources that they can address the issue on your behalf. But until there's not enough car chases in the area, right? I mean, so I'm kind of uncomfortable with that, uh, I guess, stepping point, is that they're bored with lowering crime in these areas, so it no, It's not that. It's just that they, they came on board to be police officers, okay? okay but, and when you take, and that, that's all of it. You know, community policing is part of our job, but so is catching the bad guys in the stolen cars, catching burglars, and that's a lot of what attracts a lot of police officers. They like that going out and answering calls for service and, 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 and serving the public. Maybe that's they, a, they don't yeah, want to do all of problem. one thing all the time, I think, is what, right. what happens. I, I can understand the desire for, for action. Um, but, I mean, this sort of leads me to a question of what is a, what is a police officer's perfect world look like? I mean, I envision Mayberry, but it sounds like you're envisioning something a little bit more hostile than no, that. It's just, it's just, real, it's just realistic. Uh, you know, there, there's about 2% of the people in our city uh, uh, engage in about 100% of the crime, okay? And you're going to have a criminal element no matter what city. It depends on what level 
that it gets to, right? And so police officers like, it's not just the, I mean, maybe I was misleading there a little bit, but it's not just the car chases and things like that, but the daily interactions they have with people through calls for service uh, is a large part of their job and they enjoy it or they wouldn't, they wouldn't have become police officers. And so this is just another way to, to try to get the benefits of community policing throughout the city instead of for these four neighborhoods. When you think about it, we had about what? A sergeant, we had a lieutenant, we had eight officers assigned to these four small neighborhoods. Add it up. The lieutenant, the sergeant, and eight officers is about a million dollars a year. My whole budget is $20 million a year. So it's, that's, why, that's why I say it's not sustainable. You know, it's not something we can do with our current resources. How many officers are we down to? Uh, I don't remember what it was Monday morning. I get a report every Monday morning. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to misquote myself here, uh, but it was about eight, I think, last week. We have some in the academy, and uh, it, that's a constant process. You know, you're you're training people up. There's people getting off training and going out on their own. People retire. You bring somebody in to replace them. Um, I had an unexpected retirement that's that happened to, is happening December third that we just did not expect. And it's a, a critical position because it's our canine supervisor. So we're scrambling, you know, to to, uh, to fill that position. We'll be doing interviews this week. Other, it's a constant. Okay. Other than direct swaps, I mean, as we, assuming we start recruiting and we start getting more people in and we're not just fighting a losing battle of attrition, like, as we get people in, how will they be designated? How, who, other than direct swaps, how are you going to determine whether to send to just increase our beat presence or increase the community resource presence? There's a lot of things that will drive that. Uh, it could be if, if that person comes becomes available in the middle of the winter when calls for service tend to be lower, they might go to detectives. But if it's in the middle of the football season when we're at our busiest and there's people coming to town and all those things, they could go back, they could go to patrol. So it's, it just very, depends on what's going on. Our business goes like this throughout the year. Usually it's about the same. Every time it starts to get cold, people tend to stay inside more. You don't have the, as big an issue outside. And then you've got uh, people just tend to stay inside, watch football, and behave themselves. You get into the summertime and people want to stay out later, they want to drink too much, or a little bit more than they do normally or whatever, then we have those related issues, and it, it, it fluctuates. But it's about the same, same every year. We know every December when the kids leave to go home for Christmas that we're going to have a spike in residential burglaries. We already know it. But what we do is we try to anticipate that. And we have officers that we tell them just work just this neighborhood because it's a student neighborhood. These kids have left their, uh, uh, what do you call them, PlayStations and all that stuff in their apartment and probably left the, the door unlocked. We find that a lot. But there's no forced entry. They just leave it open. And they're in Kansas City for Christmas. And meanwhile, their house is getting cleaned out. So we, we know that's going to happen. When you live in a com community of college students, those, they're, they're not always as conscientious as, as we would like them to be about locking their stuff up. Uh, and we, so we try to anticipate that. And we, that's what we use the crime analyst for. I don't remember who asked for it. But. Are you looking at these eight officers since they've had intensive experience in community policing? Are you looking at using them as sort of, for lack of a better term, force multipliers where they can train or work with regular patrol, uh, patrol officers and say, hey, you might want to think about doing it this way or have you thought about doing it this way? Or If you read the uh, report that Sergeant Fox put out, that's actually one of the things that they recommended was improving the relationships between patrol officers and our community outreach officers. Okay? And that's one of the things we, that's one of the reasons we did this is to get them more exposure to the officers that are working out there answering 911 calls and give them ideas on how to problem solve. When this team comes together to work on bigger problems, is there any kind of way to make sure that one neighborhood that's getting overwhelmed doesn't get the bulk of their attention to make sure that the people who do have just parking problems that they do still get their officer when a certain area is just, you know, getting more attention? Good question. And, and, and the, the answer is, is that the squeaky wheel is going to get the grease. Okay. And I think that's where we were going with it. What if there's not big problems going on in a particular area of the city? It would be a waste of resources to put extra resources there. So we're going to re try to react to the things that are happening around us. 
and then address the issues uh, that, that, that we deem, deem important and that the citizens deem important. One of the best lessons I ever learned was when I was a police lieutenant in Arlington, Texas. And I went to a community meeting one night, <clears throat> and I had put together a prostitution, uh, uh, I was going to say a prostitution ring, but I didn't put together <laughs> a ring. Wrong I side of the operation <laughs> to deal with the prostitution. Ring. My head is so uh, I've got a group of officers together, and there were there were uh, some topless bars in this area, and we went out there and we worked it, and we made several arrests, and we arrested Johns, and we arrested prostitutes, and we thought, great, we did ourselves on the back, right? I go to this community meeting, and I'm telling the, the public about it, these people that live in this neighborhood, and there's a lady probably about 75 years old that raises her hand in the back. She says, you know, those people don't even bother me because I'm in bed by the time they start coming in. What really bothers me is the people that are painting my fence, graffiti on my fence. So I had this epiphany that I was addressing what I thought surely the public was, would be upset about, and I completely missed the boat. So that's why it's so important to have these officers that can go in and liaison with the people that live and work and play in these individual communities and then put the resources together to address the issues that are of concern to them. That's what community policing is. I'm, I would like to make a suggestion. Okay. I don't know if it's feasible, but in um, the city utility water and light bill, they send out this thing every, every so often that has like information in it. Sure. Is it possible for you to talk to somebody and have those same eight officers like an introduction of them? Absolutely, that's an excellent in, idea. In, in that? That's an excellent because idea. everybody who has city water and lights get that. That's, a, that's an excellent suggestion. I'll make a note of that. Because I would like it's, to, I would like to know who is going to be over my beat. Sure. In case I everybody have does. An issue. And we'll we'll have it on the uh, web as well. You know, you'll be able to identify those officers. Um, you know, we'll, the only the only downside to this is that they can't work 24 hours a day. You know, you'd like to say that you'd have that one officer that's available 24 hours a day. They're not. But I'm sure they have voicemail. Oh, yeah, they do. And they have uh, email and they have uh, 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 cell phones, you know, if, if they choose to answer them on their days off. I do. I answer mine on my days off. How's the shift work? Would they be day shift? Would they be? It'll vary. How's it just pretty much spread out? Or? It will vary, vary according to the problem. If the problem's occurring at 2 o'clock in the morning, that's where they'll be, 2 in the morning. If it's occurring at 8 o'clock at night, that's when they'll work. It's going to just depend on the problem, and every problem is different. Ideally, how big would you like the community resource, community resource unit to be? What do you think is an ideal sort of size to kind of take that mission and, 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 and tackle it without um, compromising on staffing, just for that one? If I, if I had my, if I were king, I would have three of these officers in every beat, so about 24 officers. What's, what's the correlation between the 20-plus neighborhood associations that are recognized by the city to the beats and then the beats to these community resources? There is no correlation. Uh, there actually may be a neighborhood association that may cross beat boundaries. We use major thoroughfares uh, to draw the beats. We try to keep them equal as far as population, and we try to keep them equal as closely as we possibly can as for calls for, calls for service, so that one beat isn't getting beat up and one beat's not having anybody in it. So there's several factors that we use to try to draw those beat, beat boundaries, and we redraw them every few years, because things change. You've probably been seeing in the media, we were talking about it this afternoon, the new housing development plans uh, out, I think, south, southwest or west or something that was in the paper, do you remember? So, but whatever it was, we were, we were saying, okay, we're going to have to be prepared to police that. And I don't remember how many homes they were talking about building out there, but that has an impact. And we've got a plan for those things. And when we see the houses going up, it's when we need to start thinking about it. Because very soon there's going to be people living there. There's going to be kids playing in the street and playing on the sidewalk. And what percentage of CRU's time would they be running regular calls versus doing community? Um, or, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard to kind of hard to predict, but, but they're, they're going to be pretty much doing what they're doing right now. As their full-time mm -hmm. That's their full-time job, problem solving. Problem solving, and when, when practicable, taking regular calls. They won't, they won't take as many calls as a regular patrol officer. Uh, it's not going to be that practical. 
we're hoping to keep these eight officers busy throughout the city. I think we've got plenty of problems. Busy, just solving problems. Correct. So they will not be taking. That's correct. Now, we're not going to let them stand around if they don't have anything to do. Right. But <laughs> in, in the overall scheme of things, we want them working on these issues. We want them to be available so that they can work on issues that are of concern to you. How long are these officers expected to be in the CRU? You know, we have never forced anybody uh, into a unit, at least not since I've been here. Um, what you end up with is, is somebody that's kind of disgruntled. I'll tell you, I'm a good example of it. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a detective. And, uh, I was a street police officer, and I got picked as a detective. And I thought I was going to auto theft, and they sent me to burglary. And I lasted 90 days. I went in and told the, the sergeant, I said, I can't do this. I need to get back on the street. So I went back on the street. And that's how you keep them happy. I was one of those cops, and there's a lot of them just like me, that want to do it all. I'd like to work in the schools. I worked as an SRO. I rode a motorcycle. I was in SWAT. I worked patrol. I did that little short detective stint. I supervised the gang unit. So all these things that I've done throughout my career, you know, I, I did and, and enjoyed them while I did them. And that's, what the, that's what's kind of cool about law enforcement uh, as a profession, is there's so many different things you can do. And if you get bored with uniform services, you can go be a detective if you're a good officer. If you get bored with detectives, you can usually go back to uniform. You can go work traffic, work our, our street crimes unit. You know, there's, there's lots of choices that you could do, so you're not locked into doing just one job. Sorry, I wasn't able to answer your question about the expansion on the west side. I happen to live on the far east side. Okay. If I were to guess within the next five years, there's going to be, there, there's two developments out there that are brand new. There's probably going to be another 800 homes. That may be what I'm thinking of. It, it, it boggled my mind when the first development went in, and when the second one went in, there were even more. It was, I think, 70 and uh, 500 or something like that. I think that, um, you, know, you know, my friends at the fire department, they have always done a much better job anticipating things like that than the police have. Usually it's, whoops, there's 800 more houses, now we gotta assign a cop to another beat out there because it's in the city limits. When the fire department planned for it for years, they knew, talking to the planning people, that they needed a fire station out there. We're going through the strategic plan process right now. We gotta report to the council on Monday night, and that's part of it, is they've identified where they need new fire stations. Well, we're looking at policing the same way, you know, where the growth is and where the next challenge is going to be. Is there any interfacing with CFD since they oh, yeah. are doing the same thing? Oh, yeah. Why reinvent the wheel? Just That's right. kind of work together. Well, they, we, you know we where the growth different is masters. Going. Well, okay. yeah, but they know where the growth is going to be. It's going to be the same growth in the area that you're going to have to cover. Right. And, and But their problems are a little bit different. Okay. They're going to want to know how many stories the building is going to be and how many, how many houses if it's a residential area because that, that affects their workload. I got to look at it from a calls for service standpoint. Of these 800 houses, how many dis domestic disturbances are we going to get? Okay, so we've got to determine how many officers. And we're that's based that on sort of predictive policing. Right, and then then you look at okay, what are they planning to build retail-wise? Because usually when you get that, you get a convenience store somewhere. Okay, there's there's certain kind of calls for service that we get that. God forbid they bring another Walmart in here, because <laughs> those things are huge uh, call generators because uh, they're open 24 hours a day and it's just constant. So, um, I'm, God bless Walmart. I'm glad they're here. <laughs> but uh, I'm just saying that they, they really cause the headaches for the police. As long as they don't try to put 11.6 feet on top of one, they'll be okay. There. <laughs> what else? Can I take this in a little different direction? Sure. First, I apologize for stepping out. My head's not uh, where it needs. Talk about this uh, restraint tool. Oh, that, oh yeah, uh, the bolo wrap. Yeah, uh, I'm going to pass this down. This is Kevlar. There are two probes on the end. Um, be very careful when you handle it. You can actually look inside the tape on one. Unfortunately, the barb uh, came through uh, on the other one. So be very careful. They are very sharp. They're sharper than any fish hook you've ever seen. Uh, they are designed to restrain 
people in crisis. It is probably the least lethal tool that CPD will have in their uh, uh, tool chest. So okay, just, so you say crisis, what do, what do you mean? Uh, typically people that don't warrant People that might be might be mentally ill, uh, it could be somebody as simple as just somebody that's resisting the police. They're they're angry. Um, somebody's so, called so the police. So how does on. this work? I'm gonna explain it, but <laughs> but it might be somebody that's just uh, uh, just being unruly. Looks, these no. look like real. Let fish him ex looks. let him okay. explain. Well, it. Let's, let's let's explain. That'll come out of a little box that's about as big as a taser, and what it does is it shoots those that that line out. And it uses a, a blank uh, 22, you know, just a blank, just makes noise. But there's enough force for it to force this around him. So imagine Mr. DeBrun standing there, and I'm, I'm still going to get away from him. Right No, oh, because I thought the hooks went in their skin. No, I was just like, that's kind of cruel and unusual. They're designed to go in their clothes. Picture this wrapping around a person's body. So it's a modern day lasso. Right. So, like a so, net. <laughs> so my arms are using on their legs. The brunch was there for the demonstration. They asked me if I would, and I said, you don't want me doing that. Uh, so this is technology that we saw at the International Association of Chiefs of Police. So we invited the manufacturer here, and they're going to give us eight of these units that uh, we're going to put into uh, to testing and evaluation. What kind of guidelines will be issued to patrol officers on what types of people not to use these on? I don't know of anybody that you would not use them on. I would think uh, someone of a larger structure that it's not going to get as much opportunity oh, to yeah, yeah. around. Oh, yeah. Or maybe yeah. someone who's not wearing a shirt where it, those hooks are definitely going to attach to their sense type stuff that you're talking right. about. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things we didn't do with tasers. Uh, but this is so new on the market, um, you know, we don't know what it, how it's going to act in the field. We know it, how it acted under a controlled environment because we had our command staff out there at the training center and they came in and showed us how it worked. To your point, I, watch, I was at the demonstration. Um, it's effective on the legs and the uh, arms, and you'd be surprised how big the people can be, and it's still effective. They actually uh, they had a dummy there. Uh, but then they, yeah, but a was, dummy don't move. No, there was, no. There was also video, and that's why I say you'd be surprised at how, how big the people can be. I mean, this battle. this seems I can I can totally appreciate the value of this, and and I, I see this as a valuable tool for certain <coughs> situations. I also can perfectly see someone this getting embedded in someone's skin and it ripping them up, and they're it just could. covered in blood, and that's it's, the image. Yeah, it's going to depend on what they do, how they react. Um, what this does is buy this, the the police a few extra seconds to get somebody restrained, and when we talk about people in distress. Think about somebody that's that's not thinking square uh, straight and, and they're they're combative and things like that. This would be ten times better than a taser, ten times better than a pistol, ten times better than a nightstick. So every tool that we look at out there is with that in mind. Is that, that that's another very very low le lethal uh, instrument that we could use to subdue somebody. Could, is somebody going to get a hook in them? Yep, probably. It's going to happen. But you I'd, also, I'd also be concerned about people being bullowed in the legs and falling and hitting their head on anything yeah, you, concrete. You, but we wouldn't that's do somebody who's running away. Too. Yeah. This, this, this is somebody, and we've had it. We've had it happen. There was a, a very large gentleman where I think this would have applied. Uh, but he had our uh, officers at bay. The first officer that got there kept the police car between him and the, uh, the suspect. And the suspect was chasing him around the thing. Well, you start chasing an officer. This was a, a big, good-sized guy, too. You don't want him to get, catch you. But if you do, now you've got a whole different set of problems. You know, if he, he catches you, now you've got to fight with him. And so there's a much more chance of somebody getting shot or somebody getting tasered or something like that. But he was smart enough to wait until his backup arrived, and then there were three or four officers there. And unfortunately, this gentleman decided to go over and open the door on the canine unit. And the dog came and joined the fight. And of course, it was over at that point.
<laughs> but yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. We're not we're not naive about that. Uh, one of the things, one of the biggest uh, opportunities I think law enforcement had was when tasers first came out. Uh, we missed the opportunity to uh, put some rules in place. In fact, it was all going on when I arrived here, uh, ten, almost 10 years ago now. But we didn't give officers those guidelines. You know, we just said, here's, here's another less lethal thing. And, and then when we had somebody die, I think, in Moberly uh, that was tased three times, we learned real quickly from, from our mistakes. Uh, but what we're, what we're looking for is something that's less lethal that will help solve us a problem when we're out there. And uh, we're, we're open to ideas that, that are new. Well, I can appreciate that. And I think you've got the right mindset. I mean, as far as, like, developing rules now and being clear about that so even just everyone's on board and knowing what to expect and right. what to expect from the police. I think that engenders a lot of trust in what, what you guys are trying to achieve. Well, this, this the beauty of this thing, and I'm glad Mr. DeBrunt saw it, uh, you know, is the lethality of it is just – just minimal. I mean, it's, you're not going to kill anybody with it. You're not going to seriously hurt somebody with it. Uh, but it, it, it's just designed to give officers a few, few extra seconds uh, to get some capacitation. Yep. When, when you say a few extra seconds, I keep on having this picture of someone like easily getting out of it when you just say uh, well, no, a few it, extra it, it, seconds. Well, no, it's a distraction, okay? Because when it went off, it sounds like a 22 going off. So it's a distraction. I would imagine people are going to think, well, he just shot me, you know? Uh, but but it shoots this projectile out there that just wraps around your body. Now you're, you've got another problem here. You can't fight the officer if your arms are incapacitated. You can't run from the officer if it's got it around your legs. So it gives the officer a few seconds to get in, get hands on, and get you under control. Kevlar. It's so not strength. Once the person's restrained, mm -hmm. how do you unrestrain them to get them you in can cut. You can cut it off. You can Once you got them cuffed, you can take it off. If there's a, pro, a, a probe in them, that we'll call an ambulance, and they can get oh, it. Oh, yeah, but I mean, like you've got them like this. How do you handcuff them when they are tied up? It's designed for you to take it off and get their their hands in position okay. so you can handcuff them. You're going to be able to rotate them within inside the circle. Oh, within while they are? Okay. And it may miss, okay? They, they showed us. We had an officer step up and, and shot at the dummy and completely missed it. And they, they said, you don't, don't, don't think like a gun. This is, this is something you need to get toward the person's torso. And then they, they, they told him to do it again, and it worked just fine. Is there a laser or what type of aiming yeah, system? It's, it's got an aiming, an aiming system on it. That's a green one, isn't it? Green, yep. And um, so they can see where it's supposed to go. And, of course, that's approximate. Right. I would think it's moving fast enough that probably a, a, a slight wind wouldn't affect it much, but I think if you had 20 mile per hour winds, it's probably not going to be that effective. And what range does an officer have to 15 be? 15 to 22 feet, I think, is what yeah. they said. Yeah. 25, the ideal. Ma 25 max. This kind of reminds me of Goliath. Of what? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit, yes. yeah, with the, the thing that they use in biblical times with the rocks on the end or whatever it was. The sling. It's the slingshot thing. Though. Yeah. What did they call it? The slingshot. Sling. Slingshot. <laughs> I don't think it was sling. a slingshot. It was a no, sling. No, it's a sling. sling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sling. I'm, just, I'm still concerned by you saying that you use this on people in crisis. Are we, we're just talking, we're not talking like mental health crises. We're talking about like people that are fighting back against the police, right? It could be somebody, for instance, if we thought somebody that was in a mental health crisis that was going to hurt themselves. We could see it as a possibility, but it's not going to be our first choice. But what we're trying to do is give officers, and, and you know, the, the first time we say, okay, this is the only time you'll ever use it, some, something new is going to come up, okay? So you got to be ready for that. And that's what I was kind of where I was going with tasers a minute ago, is we learned from them. You know, we learned uh, very quickly when a, a department in Florida tasered a guy off of a bicycle that wouldn't stop. Well, the guy fell off the bicycle and the police car ran over him because the officer was just stuck his hand out the window. We learned not to do that on bicycles. Um, an agency back in Texas, they learned not to, to, to tase people running across parking lots when they're running away from you because the guy fell forward and knocked all of his teeth out. So uh, bad things happen when you're using force. Force is never uh, a pretty thing. I mean, it's, it's bad. So one of the things that, that's attractive about this is that it, it looks very minimal to me and it allows officers to take control of an individual that, that is in crisis or, or wants to resist. Just one other thing they can put on their belt. Speaking of belts, what about the new uh, body-worn K-9 
carriers. Those are those are coming out as the officer's vest is replaced. Okay. We replace a vest every five years, so you've probably seen some officers out there that have them already. Mm -hmm. And uh, when the ones that don't, we'll get them eventually. Now, is that going to be officer choice, or is it going department-wide? No, it's going department-wide. We'll at least offer that. They're not required. They can carry a traditional, because uh, I'm not going to do it. I, I just carry a traditional gun belt. Mm -hmm. uh, it's primarily for officers. There's carrying so many things on their belt now, more than when I came into this business back in 1977. And, and we got to have a place to put it. So these are actually load-bearing vests where they can I was about spread. to ask, are these like load-bearing vests, similar to what the military uses? Right. Okay. And I was very resistant to them because I think they look more militaristic. There, there's just no way around it. Uh, but we talked to the police association. It was something they felt strongly about. And I said, okay, we'll give them a try. But I'd been fighting them for years. And their answer to me always was, there's departments all over the country going to it. For your perspective, what is like the what does the equipment creep look like? What, how much how much more equipment is an officer carrying today than they would have carried at various points in the past? Like just from your experience in your okay. career, I carried two speed loaders, my pistol, and a handcuff case. Now they've got another case on there for rubber gloves. Now they've got another case on there for their taser. Uh, if we they do something like this, they're going to have a case on there for that. Most officers. I never did, but a lot of officers like to carry extra set of handcuffs in case they need them for a larger person, maybe. Um, they got their, uh, they don't use revolvers anymore, but they're magazines for their pistol. So, and everything seems to be heavier. So uh, there's a lot more of it, and, and officers just want to be more comfortable. And those are actually cooler when they come into the station. If it's a hot day, they can actually take that vest off. And then go in there and do their reports and everything, and then they get ready to hit the street, put it back on. It's real easy to on and off. Is there going to be a standardization of equipment loadout? Yes. Like, like with where it's placed? So yes. Okay. Yeah. That was one of the things we had to negotiate. Anything else going on in the city that we should know about or anything? We just had a presidential visit. How'd that, <laughs> that go was, overall? It went very well. It went very well. Uh, we worked for the better part of uh, about a week and a half with the Secret Service getting ready for that. Um, it's very interesting. It's the first one that I was in charge of, uh, but um, they're, they're great to work with, and it turned out fine. I was very, very glad we didn't have to motorcade him anywhere because that's a huge deal. And was were there truly no arrests at that event? Yeah, we didn't make any arrests. But, you know, most of that is, um, you know, it's the, the campaign there uh, is the, um, the, the, I'll tell you right now, there was mostly Trump supporters, so there wasn't a lot of people. There was, there was a few, few people that yelled at each other and things like that, but nothing major. How many people do you, th do you anticipate? They had, them, I think, I would estimate probably ten to 12,000. That include the outside? Yes. And yeah, the venue well, they were in was not that big. Not that big at all. Um, I think they could only seat 500, I think, was the number. Nobody else was outside. It was not a pleasant night to be outside. Were there any problems with people getting back to their cars? I saw some of the parking. Oh, yeah. It was just oh, yeah. insane. Well, you know, the you, you got it's an interesting concept because you've got the Secret Service that we were working with that is solely uh, focused on the president and the safety of the president. And then you've got the campaign who was bringing the people there to be the president and to hear him speak and all that. And they had a completely different set of, of standards. They, they were worried about parking and things like that. Secret Service did not. So the Secret Service, we said, you know, there's only going to be so many cars out here. Yeah, we know. I'm concerned about that. <laughs> That's not our problem. So the event planners, when they finally got to town, uh, you know, we told them they're calling for rain. Oh, yeah, well, we're going to use that uh, bean field over there. We've already got permission from the owner. You're not going to if it's wet. Right. It was a lot of people. Yeah. Stuck. So they had some cars went up there. And they just sunk down to the axles and they had to get pulled out. But that was about the major, major biggest problem we had. I saw something about the governor. Yes. That uh, was related to. I'm sorry. I didn't get to read the article. Yeah. It's related to the officer that was involved in the shooting last year. Which shooting? The. Uh, uh, Mr. Coates shooting. 
Brungar. And um, they look at cases like that and determine whether or not the officer did something brave and, and or distinguished service, and then they, they provide them an award. Anything else, any trends, anything that you see or anything that you anticipate? I'm going to be very surprised if our complaints aren't up this year. Why is that? Our internal affairs complaints. It's just a sense. I haven't done a count or anything like that. It just seems that we're getting more of them. And they tend to be, um, I won't call them frivolous, but I'll call them uh, unfounded. We get a lot of unfounded complaints that um, it's kind of surprising to me because what they, they allege didn't really happen. And, you know, one of the things that I continue to be glad we got, me and Mr. DeBruns were talking about it yesterday, is the body cameras. Uh, they'll come up with a fantastic story about the officer eating their driver's license or something, you know, and we go and we look at the video and it just didn't happen. So I don't know if it's a national trend because of the, the high visibility of law enforcement or if it's just something local, but we'll find out when we count them up at the end of the year. Are you seeing it in any one category? Not really. Or is it pretty Kind much? of across the board. Yeah, we're still, I still think we're in line. You know, we, we get a remarkably few complaints um, for the number of contacts we have. We estimate we have about 150,000 contacts a year. And, um, that's on calls for service, and it's, that's involuntary contacts. It's the other half of them. And you guys know what you get. You just don't get that many, at least not on appeal. And um, so we try to take care of our business over there so you don't get uh, lambasted with them, you know. Uh, but, uh, and we make mistakes. And when we do, we try to fix them. What types of things are you seeing internally from internally generated complaints? Probably about the same number uh, that we've had in the past. I don't, I don't see anything out of line there. Um, one of the things I think we've been able to establish over the years, um, and I don't know who I'll make with, mad with this, somebody probably, but um, when I got here, there was a tendency to ignore some things. And I think we have a group of supervisors now that we, we've promoted through the past few years that are now recognizing that it's easier to deal with it when it's simple than until it gets to be something big. So they're more willing to go ahead and say, hey, need to talk to you about that mistake you made and let's get it fixed on the front end. What types of problems without, you know, sp without specific officers, just trends, what types of things are you seeing? It could be something as simple as being late for work, you know, uh, something that simple. Or it could be the way they talk to people. And I had one in my office the other day that I said, this is your last hurrah. Um, I don't know if you'll get to hear the appeal or not, but maybe you will if there is an appeal, but the complaint was sustained and I had to be very upfront with the officer and just say, this is your last one. We're not going to talk to people like that. Good for you. Well, it, it's, if you saw the tape and you may get the opportunity, I mean, it would boggle your mind why it even went that way. It just didn't have to. And, and are you using tracking software to keep track of these types of complaints? Oh yeah, against, oh, yeah. Um, yeah you've heard of Blue Team. We've told you about. Oh yeah, meeting. but yeah. is That's there software it, that kind of keeps trends? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, we, it's it's got an early warning system component. That's what I was yeah. asking. Yeah, and so if you have a series, and, and the, we can set the the uh, thresholds. So the, let's say an officer uses force more than three times in a thirty day period, and um, or uses a taser or whatever, we'll get an alert. And the supervisor is required to go back and review all of those instances to find out if we've got a problem. Of course, we're looking at every one of them individually anyway, but this <clears throat> alert system tells you when you've had this many, you know, in a certain period of time. One of the things I'm pretty happy about is, is the number of times that we point our guns at people has dropped pretty significantly. That, the reason for that is, is when I came here, I always love telling these stories, but when I came here, uh, we didn't document when we pointed a gun at somebody. We didn't shoot it. We didn't think that was a use of force. And I said, well, it damn sure is. And, and when you point a gun at somebody, they take it very seriously. Well, now there's a national trend. The other departments are picking up, and they're now monitoring it. So it's something that I've, we've been doing for a long time that, that we were ahead of the game on. 
and I'm proud to say that, uh, that, it, that it does work. When you're requiring somebody to justify why they're, why they're doing that, they're a hell of a lot less, less likely to do it, or, or at least in, uh, if they do do it, they have a justification. And do you think that also leads to a hesitancy of an officer to draw his firearm? I don't. His or her firearm? I don't. I don't. And, and I'll tell you why. Because, you know, we, we you probably heard some of the sergeants that have come up here and been your representatives here. That uh, I, I tell our officers that we don't use force. We respond to resistance. We look at force that way. Uh, the officer is going to react to whatever the person is, is causing them to do. What you don't want is an officer that's going to overreact. So we respond to that use to that uh, resistance accordingly, and it tends to be less use of force. And I don't think it has a, a factor of, of hesitating, having anybody hesitate. Um, could could there be somebody out there that, that that's hesitating? I think probably so, because uh, nationally it's getting much more attention. I only hope and pray that they're not out there taking unnecessary chances when they when they should be taking care of uh, whatever it is they're supposed to do. But I couldn't sit here and tell you unequivocally that they're not. Uh, they're human beings, and there's going to be people that are going to say, you know what, uh, I'll just take this chance and not be on the front page of the paper. Generally, have you seen the retention rates kind of level off, or are they at at the same rate that they've been, where you're losing officers at the same rate, or they've kind of flattened out, or uh, how's it been? What, what a lot of people don't realize is that uh, over the past five to six years, our profession has had some of the luster rub, rubbed off of it, and uh, we're not getting the applicants that we did. Um, by way of example, I use myself as an example all the time. There were two. Uh, academy classes in the city of Dallas, 24 officers each, and there were almost 3,000 applicants. And we're getting probably, for every vacancy we have, maybe three. It's just not that glamorous a job anymore. Uh, so much more that goes with it that people are hesitating. They can make more money elsewhere doing something else. Um, and we, the ones that we're losing, we're finding, get into the job and go, you know what, this just isn't what I thought it was going to be. Well, so based off that, what, what's your read of morale right now in the department? I think that uh, morale is, is like it always is. You know, there's an old saying amongst police chiefs, there's two things that police officers don't like, change and the way things are. <laughs> And that's what I've learned to be true. Um, you know, you talk to, to 20 different officers, you'll get 20 different versions of what's upsetting them. And maybe it's the chief hasn't let us have load-bearing vests yet. Some other one says, I got three days off for talking to somebody mean on a call, and I got three days off, so I'm mad at the chief for that. And you always have those issues in a, an organization of 200-plus people. But... I think that it fluctuates. Uh, I think that the council uh, did the best they could during the budget cycle. Uh, the fact that they did get a raise this year, or, or most of them did, um, I can't even say most of them. Anybody that had five years in grade, you know, wherever they were, got uh, moved to the midpoint of the range. But uh, those things are very hard to control uh, when they look at St. Louis and St. Louis gives a 40% raise. They're wondering why they only got five. It's a good question. Uh, but, but we're not the same size as St. No, Louis. We're not. I mean, we're that's not. a question that answers itself pretty quickly. Right, that's right. And that's why you have to be real careful with the, the morale question or the morale answer. You know, there's so many things that affect it. And it could be that I'm stuck on night shift and I want to be on days. It could be something as simple as that. And I don't have the seniority to get there. I had an officer call me the other day that said, uh, I can get a free apartment, but they want me to have a take-home car. And I said, I can't give you a take-home car. I'd have to give one to, to, to Daryl next, and then Cornelia next, and then Val's going to want one, and I don't have them to give. I said, that's a cycle we can't start. Well, I saw so-and-so had one. I said, well, so-and-so's in SWAT and has to respond from their home. That's why they have the car. And so, yeah. So, yeah, that's the answer. But... Uh, yeah, morale's, morale's something that, that we constantly chase. Um, I think as a city, um, we're, we're having an issue with it right now when it comes to pay and things like that because we've, we've gotten behind. 
So it's no different in the police department. Would, would staffing, like, we, there's obviously been so much talk about we need more police officers. Would the staffing help offset some of that for those who might be concerned about pay? I think or? so. I think so. Because right now there are shifts where officers are frustrated that they can't get a day off in addition to their days off. They want to take an extra day. We don't have the officers to let them off. That's a, that's a big source of frustration. But the answer is, the alternative is, to leave a beat empty or, you know, just one less officer out there. And so now the danger to the officer goes up, to the officers that are working. So we don't do any, try not to do anything malicious that's, that's just going to, just to make them mad. We try to keep them happy. But there's so many balls we have to keep up in the air when it comes to pay, when it comes to benefits, when it comes to shifts. Um, you know, the, we're the only 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week social service agency that exists. Right? So people don't know who to call, they're calling us. And a lot of times that's not a police matter. And so a that's a source of frustration. I've been a supervisor for over 15 years. And Crying things that you have to deal with. You got to deal with why these two folks don't get along. And I mean, just some crazy stuff. Yeah. Someone raised the possibility of including a social worker or a social person in CPD I'd love to it. handle some of those issues. I'd love it. To get some of the officers back. Has, it, has anybody explored that with you? No, but to get officers back? To, uh, to get officer, uh, free up some officer time to They, they do cost money. Work. There were some grants a few years ago, and we had a, a part-timer mm -hmm. uh, that we could call on. The, the problem with uh, having the, it was in domestic violence. We have one that works with us on domestic violence. The problem with it is, is you can't leave them alone. The officer doesn't relieve the officer because the officer has to stay as long as they're at the scene. So you'd have to have somebody that, you know, was a full police officer. So there, there's good and bad. Uh, their skills in solving pro people's problems, you know, are, are, are better sometimes than maybe the police officer. Uh, so it's good to have them around. But the specific areas like that where we're talking about um, uh, domestic violence and things like that, uh, we've also started uh, a program called uh, You Have Options. Um, What's that? It's a uh, sexual assault reporting system. Um, when a person is sexually assaulted, historically the police have said, uh, you have to tell us what happened, who did it to you, that sort of thing. We live in a college community, and I started thinking about that. And <clears throat> Imagine being a young student here at MU and going through that ordeal and then having to deal with the police. There, there's varying levels that you want to deal with. You may not want your parents to find out. On the other hand, you may not care who finds out. You, you want the, your, your, your personality says you want that person to go to jail and then everything in between. So the options are that we tell them this is your investigation. We're going to do this. We're going to tell you before we do it. If you want us to stop the investigation, we'll do that. You can come back to us later and say restart it. You can say give it a month off. You can say I don't want to do it at all. Um, all we ask is that you go ahead and give us the medical stuff that we need, and we won't do anything with it if you tell us not to. So it takes this, the, the trauma that, that the police inadvertently was, was administering to this victim uh, out of the equation and allows them to report at their pace and report what they want. And so they can change their mind at any time. And, and, and in law enforcement, historically, what we've done is once we had the report, we're going to investigate it. And then we're going to give it to the DA. And the victim may not want that. So um, it's, it's kind of a new program. Sounds like an interesting approach. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more fair to our victim. Anything else from members? Anything that we can do for you or anything that you have like always to had that attitude, doing? Mr. Smith, and I appreciate it. Um, I was talking to Mr. DeBrunch yesterday. I think he's got some ideas for the future, and if I can help with those, I'd, I'd be happy to do it. Uh, I'm not going to steal his thunder. <laughs> <laughs> Let him tell you. All right. Well, if there's nothing else, we appreciate you coming in, and we always 
benefit benefit very much from your coming in every six months. I appreciate your uh, hearing, me, hearing me. And there's a lot of new members. Um, my my door's open. I think Mr. DeBruns will tell you that. You ever decide you want a, a, the nickel tour or you want me to do something special for you, you want me to set you up a ride along, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'd kind of like to, to leave the department an open book. We brought people in from the CPRB what, a few years ago to look at policies and things. You're welcome to come in and view anything you'd like. Yes, sir. Uh, you allowed me to sit in on what I think you call a manager's meeting. Correct. Uh, recommend that for the rest of the board? I would. It's, it's time consuming and we generally have them once a month and they're about a two hour meeting. Manager, manager stands for management and accountability through geographic review. We just use the word manager. And what we do is we review the crime data, uh, the individual lieutenants that are assigned to the individual areas of the city report on what's going on crime wise within their beat. And we ask them what they're doing about it. It's based on the CompStat model that originated in New York City back in the 90s. Uh, where, and it was much more adversarial then. Uh, you could get fired at a CompStat meeting. This is not like that. You go in and uh, I think you found it informational about what was going on in different parts of the city and what different lieutenants might be dealing with that are different because they, they have a different part of town. What I found of most value is the fact that there's a lot of things CPD does proactively to defuse situations that poorly on the community uh, give me for those of you in the press but it's stuff you never read about in the paper or see on television I would I would encourage all board members to when is it uh, we have one It's not just what they're doing in response to things that are going on, negative things. It's situations, CPDC situations, and they believe they can help resolve it before it gets out of hand. Uh, get back to you, or I'll get with Rose and let you know when the next was on the schedule. We have a monthly, like I said. And uh, you're welcome to stay as long or as little as you want. If you just want to come in for five minutes, that's, you're welcome. You introduce yourself, and um, we'll let you listen to what we do on a monthly basis to try to keep you safe. Great. Okay. Oh, if there's nothing else, we appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Thank the, you. Other, the other part of that was if you guys ever get, get into talking about something and you want me to come back more often, just holler. You know, I know we have to do it by ordinance twice a year. Rose calls me and reminds me. Badgers me? No, she just reminds me. <laughs> you don't want Rose me, on She you. makes sure I'm here. So, <clears throat> but I'd be happy to come more often or if, if an issue comes up that you want to discuss. We appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.